Friends, welcome to this daily devotion. I'm Pastor Mark, and I have the privilege of serving the United Methodist Church of the Frankfurt, Mokina, and New Lenox areas. I ask that you come to this time with an open heart and an open mind. Ready yourself that we may truly come into the presence of God and leave transformed as people living in abundant life. Friends, hear this invocation as we join together in an attitude of prayer. Almighty God, in every age you have called faithful people to be your faithful servants. We believe you are now calling us to join that great company who sought to follow you. Grant us today and every day a clearer vision of your call and strengthen us to fulfill that ministry which you have assigned to us. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, our theme this week has been the call to ministry. And we believe all people are called to ministry, to partner with God in the reconciliating reconciliation that Christ sought to bring to the cosmos, to the universe, to all people. Our guiding psalm this week has been Psalm 63 or 62, excuse me, uh, we will start in verse 9, the final stanza. Human beings are nothing but a breath. Human beings are nothing but lies. They don't even register on a scale. Taken all together, they are lighter than a breath. Don't trust in violence. Don't set false hopes in robbery. When wealth bears fruit, don't set your heart on it. God has spoken one thing. Make it two things. And I myself have heard. That strength belongs to God, and faithful love comes from you, my Lord, and that you will repay everyone according to their deeds. God bless the reading of the psalm today. You know, it can be disheartening, I guess, reading some of these uh, psalms that kind of talk about, oh, what are, what are human beings but worms? What are human beings but a breath? What are human beings but lies? And... and and you can kind of take that and, and create a theology of um, of how bad humans are and how bad creation is. But I really don't think that's David's intent. I think David's intent is to get out of our self-importance, to get out of how big we think we are in comparison to the grand narrative. Sometimes we think, you know, we're all that in a bag of chips. And in the grand scheme of things, in, in, the, in the grand scheme of history, in the grand scheme of the earth, the grand scheme of the universe, the cosmos, we're pretty insignificant. Yet, God calls out to us, loves us, and encourages us to partner with God in creating new things. That's the very first story in the Bible. In reconciling the world into that relationship which God intended. Wonderful, wonderful affirmation. But it takes a certain humility. And sometimes that's something we desperately need to recapture our humility. Our anthology reading today, if I can get my page here, comes from The Wounded Healer, by Henry Nowen. While personal concern is sustained by a continuously growing faith in the value and meaning of life, the deepest motivation for leading our fellow man to the future is hope. For hope makes it possible to look beyond the fulfillment of urgent wishes and pressing desires and offers a vision beyond human suffering and even death. A Christian leader is a person of hope whose strength in the final analysis is based neither on self-confidence derived from his personality nor on the specific expectations for the future, but on a promise given to them. This promise not only made Abraham travel to an unknown territory, not only inspired Moses to lead his people out of slavery, it also is the guiding motive for any Christian who keeps pointing to new life even in the face of corruption and death. Without this hope, 
we will never be able to see value and meaning in the encounter with a decaying human being and become personally concerned. This hope stretches far beyond the limitations of one's own psychology and strength. For it is anchored, not just in the soul of the individual, but in God's self-disclosure in history. Leadership, therefore, is not called Christian because it is permeated with optimism against all the odds of life, but because it is grounded in the historic Christ event, which is understood as a definitive breach in the deterministic chain of the human trial and error, as a dramatic affirmation that there is light on the other side of darkness. Every attempt to attach this hope of visible symptoms in our surroundings becomes a temptation when it prevents us from the realization that promises, not concrete successes, are the basis of Christian leadership. Many ministers, priests, and Christian lay per persons have become disillusioned, bitter, even hostile, when years of hard work bear no fruit, when little change is accomplished. Building a vocation on the expectations of concrete results, however, is conceived, however conceived, is like building a house on sand instead of on solid rock, and even takes away the ability to accept successes as free gifts. Hope prevents us from clinging to what we have, frees us to move away from the safe place and enter unknown fearful territory. This might sound romantic, but when someone enters with the fellow human beings into fear, into their own fear of death, and is able to await with them right there, leaving that safe place. They might turn out to be a very diff different, difficult act of leadership. It is an act of discipline ship in which we follow the ro hard road of Christ, who inner death with nothing but bare hope. God bless the reading. I apologize there at the end. I was trying to change the exclusive language <laughs> to be inclusive and uh, messed up a little bit. Uh, I love Henry, though. Um, and and he, you know, has this way of challenging us. And, and I see this time and time again. And I, I get, fr I'm, you know, I, I'll just be honest. It's one of my frustrations. Dealing with Christians in my context who are constantly negative. Oh, the world. Oh, the times. Oh, the kids. Oh, the, like, like, you got to stop. Because Christians throughout history have always said that. Parents have always said, kids these days, parents have always said, oh, this music, man, Beethoven, that quack. Like, like history has repeated itself thousands of times, and yet we haven't learned that what you see is not necessarily what you get. And results are not necessarily fruit. Your good old days were someone else's horror story. We have to deal with that and own up to it and acknowledge it because there are better days. I remind people, last century was a nightmare. Like, I grew up in the 80s and 90s. Things were pretty exciting. Things were pretty good. But if you look at the 1900s as a century, it is the bloodiest and most violent century in human history. That's not speculation. That's just pure fact. More people died by war and violence than in any other century in human history and died in pretty terrible ways, from trench warfare to nuclear war. We cannot live in our nostalgic view of good old days. We should live in hope. Hope grounded, not on going back to the way it was. Hope grounded on Jesus Christ, our rock and our salvation. That's why Psalm 62 has been our theme psalm this week. Our rock. Our hope is built on nothing less. Nothing less. And our hope calls us to do crazy, ridiculous, idiotic things. Things the world sees as foolish, prodigal. Because we worship a prodigal father who had a prodigal son. Who gave his life foolishly for you and for me. 
So let's not bemoan how things are. Let's not live in our misguided interpretation of good old days. Let's build on the foundation of Christ and offer hope to a world in desperate need of nothing less. Got a little preachy, I apologize. Our scripture reading is uh, this is uh, 1 Corinthians. I'm a preacher after all. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. Look at your situation when you were called, brothers and sisters. By ordinary human standards, not many were wise. Not many were powerful. Not many were from the upper class. But God chose what the world considers foolish to shame the wise. God chose what the world considers weak to shame the strong. God chose what the world considered low class and low life, what's considered to be nothing to reduce what is considered to be something to nothing. So no human being can brag in God's presence. It is because of God that you are in Christ Jesus. He became wisdom from God for us. This means that he made us righteous and holy. He delivered us. This is consistent with what is written. The one who brags should brag in the Lord. God bless the reading of Paul uh, and the letter to the Corinthians. You know, I, I, you know, I I've met some people that you know I, I don't I don't know I've ever met somebody who has a literal belt with notches for how many souls they've saved. Uh, but I've met some people who kind of live in that. You know, I got a notch in my belt for every soul I save, and and if people ask me how many souls have you saved, my answer is zero. Um, I, and I think that's an honest answer. I've, I've saved zero souls because that's not my job. Because Christ saved us all. And if I've done anything, it's been help lead people to Christ. Or walked with them on that journey. Or offered them another pathway to the cross. To the empty grave. To discipleship. And God uses everyone. Let me rephrase that because that can have negative connotations. God is willing and able. God calls everyone into ministry. God invites everyone to participate. Regardless. My daughter who has untold physical, medical issues, conditions, etc., who, who will never amount to anything in the light of the world, who, who will never hold a job or have a relationship or get married or have children, uh, who will never have fame or fortune who won't graduate high school. I mean, she may technically, but not really. She has already done great ministry in her short 11 years of life. She's helped transform people. She has shared good news. She's grown in love. She has the intelligence of a six-month-old, maybe, on a good day, and probably always will. She has no physical capabilities to do things for herself, yet God has been able to use her to do good things. God did not make her like she is. We did that. Human beings did that. But God took something that we did that was terrible, and invited her and us into a way to make it good. I, I say that to say, however bad you feel about yourself, get over it. Because God loves you and values you and wants to bring you along to do great things. Friends, today we practice prayers of intercession, praying for others 
And to do so, we use our simple five-finger prayer. And I'll put it on the screen for you so that in silence you can pray for those closest to you, those in authority, our leaders, those who are weak, and finally, and most importantly, yourself. Let us pray the prayer that Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.